and we're back guys right so i won't get fined <laughs> uh, let, excited about this one brother because you know honestly man I, I tried to kind of dibble and dabble into your background and and every time i did i i kept pulling back layers of this onion and like the rabbit hole is brutal it's brutal <laughs> so i'm um, pretty excited to kind of get into it and we had a format and there was something you always said to me and there was one thing i kind of want to start off because i think our audience and everybody that might that might appreciate it. I would. So maybe it's self-serving. You did a lot of work back home in Pakistan. Are you Pakistani American? Are you American? Like, how do you consider yourself? Yeah. So that's, and, that's and this is coming very from interesting. A, a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is coming from a Lebanese kid who's like exactly. straight off the boat. So like, I wonder how you assimilated and then, and that imposter syndrome that comes from, Hey, I'm an immigrant founder or I'm not, or like, where do we start yeah. standing tall? Wow. No, I, I appreciate. Um, so first off, thank you. And we brother. start. <laughs> um, right? Yeah, they, we're, we're going in deep. So thank you. Um, so going going on that, so there's actually a term. I don't know if, if uh, you know, in the Arab world, you have the same. But for Desis, right? Like Pakistanis, Indians, Sri Lankans, Bangladeshis, there might be more. Um, but anybody who's considered, uh, it, it's called ABCD, American Born Confused Desi. Because you know, so uh, to to quite, kind of quickly recap for myself, right? So I was born in Detroit, like Motor Motown, before a, a little south of um of uh, uh Dearborn, but before. So I was asking like, my there's dad. There's not about a more this. quintess. Oh, <laughs> there's like not a more quintessential uh, bummer. It could be on mine. No, nah, it's on mine. There's not a more quintessential American like place to be born like let's just call a spade a spade that's interesting so i couldn't tell you that because so my my so i was born in dearborn or a little south like it's called southfield um apparently before it actually got a really heavy like arab um like population or presence and then when i was two years old roughly my parents moved to san jose so san jose has been kind of like that's a wrap exactly because you know, growing up in Detroit, my dad apparently I I fell into a lake once, like a frozen lake, and he had to pull me out. And Is that, that why you're that a little right, like a little <laughs> on the side? But <laughs> but um yeah, so uh so going back to it, right? Like American born confused basically, and and that was something which I think for the first like first two halves of my life because so until I was eight years old, I was in the U.S. I was in San Jose like until third grade. And then my parents decided to move to Pakistan or or my dad was still here. But my mom, my sister and I, my parents decided, you know, it was for whatever reason to move there. Um, so imagine at I'm third or in the third grade, I speak funny over there as well. I have an accent and I don't get along with anybody. So it took a while to understand where to fit. And thank God I had a huge family and, and support network. And I used to keep coming back to San Jose every summer uh, because my dad was here. So. I kind of got both ends of the spectrum. And then eventually, like, I think it was in my 20s when I finally was just like, hey, I'm like, there comes a point when you realize you're too American for one culture and then you're too Pakistani for the other. And you're just like, and part of the reason why I love the US is because you can be whoever the, whoever you are, right? Um, and like, you don't have to hide it. So I consider myself more American weirdly enough, just because like, it's more of the culture that I've grown up with. I've spent more time in the U S than I have in Pakistan, like so third grade through a levels, which is like uh, an extra year of high school over there in the British yeah. system. Um, so did that, then came back, went to San Jose state for mechanical engineering. Um, cause I loved cars. Um, one of the first things that I wanted, or one of my dreams growing up was to own my own kind of garage, like fast and furious style and work on cars all my life. I even I did like, like mechanic work and stuff like, um, you know, so uh, did that. And then around, so growing up, it was a lot like being weirdly, uh, you know, just so in Pakistan, like the school system and, you know, kind of culture and everything is very different. And then when you come here, it's completely, you know, uh, like the, the friends, the family friends who I grew up with. Um, I, I was able to assimilate in both areas very well mm. uh, just because of a lot of uh, family support. And then it kind of transitioned into the entrepreneurship side because um, 
I grew up with so many people. And and go, this kind of ties in with the imposter syndrome question that you, you asked. Well, well, excuse me, because, you know, uh, being Pakistani and, you know, for uh, like a quick tidbit, my grandparents were born in India. My parents were born in Pakistan. And then I was born, my sister and I were born in the US. Like, you know, so so a lot of confusion there, a lot of just like, you know, trying to assimilate and, and trying to figure out our place. So because of um, well, being in Pakistan, you have friends and family who are in like Canada and Europe or in Asia. And when they come by and you see like, hey, some of these people are look different and are different and yep. are, are comfortable with who they are, you kind of get the, your own motivation, especially being American. Like to to find your fit and and you know if somebody does you wrong at least in the U.S. and we've, we've seen those justice systems and the political systems outside um, at least however we you know whoever we support and stuff at least whoever you are in the U.S. you can get certain things done so yep. um, that's where kind of the imposter syndrome where you know it 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 varies where on the one hand because working with startups and working with some amazing people, you see what's possible, right? So you know that you need to have a certain amount of confidence and ego to be able to just focus and not care about what all the naysayers say and just try to make it happen. And then when it doesn't happen, then there, it happens for everybody where a lot of the the kind of the, the pressure and the, the uh, negative kind of feedback that you're keeping at bay, it just kind of floods all together, right? And and then learning how to kind of rebuild yourself and then focusing on like, hey, something as long as you don't hurt somebody, as long as you don't like screw somebody over uh, financial like fraud or anything, um, I feel like and, and most of my investors actually taught me this too over the years where, you know, at the end of the day, if I can go to them and say, hey, I'm very sorry with how things worked out. Um, but if they could, they well, the, the very first one taught me like, hey, as long as I can tell you that there was no fraud, like you did everything you could, and I appreciate you for you know keeping me in the loop and and for everything. That's all they they wanted to ask for. Obviously, it was on myself and my team to make it work. But in many cases, and and you see this as well, right? Like where a, depending on who you are as a person, people will give you a, a shot. And that's also helped me with the imposter syndrome, where as long as I am true to myself and I believe in what I'm doing, it makes it so much easier to reach out to somebody and say, hey, I'm working on this. Can you give me some feedback or yeah. can you make this introduction? You and don't I feel salesy. Exactly. And, and the salesy bit, I, I never really felt comfortable with. Um, I was actually told, like, when we get to it, you know, like right now I'm trying to figure out the next step of my career and, and what to do. And one aspect which I figured out was like, hey, even though I've been an entrepreneur, on the sales side, I feel like, you know, there are things that I need to learn and, and things I can improve. So Good on you. Good on you, man. You know, it's That's it's cool a constant, because, like, yeah. taking feedback and trying to fix it. Right? So, All right, let me, I got to, sorry, great in theory, I got to push back on practicality. Tactically, when did you realize like, oh, I got to learn more? Like, probably not high school. In high school, you're like, I got this. Like, at some point, you were... Were you humbled so much or did you just succeed so much and realize, because I feel like it's the two extremes that get to that point and nothing in between. Either you get absolutely pummeled or you're just on another level and you almost, not pity, but you're like, ah, oh, let me, like, it's the ego is completely removed on both sides of the scale. Yeah. Um, way I would answer that question is by saying, like, for me, well, through high school, well, high school because of yeah, my family, give us a, the, the yeah. people that I, you know, my... My family, um, like my parents worked very hard. Uh, my extended family has not only people who are self-made, but then also people who are, you know, have generational wealth, have built businesses on their own. So I had decided early on, like, hey, I want to try my hand at business, right? Or at least work with people where I can own a piece of business and get some like financial security down the line. Um, and so when I went to San Jose State for mechanical engineering, that was kind of the generalist engineering. My dad also did that, but he pivoted to uh, programming later on in his life and did very well for that. Um, so the way I thought about it was if I can learn mechanical engineering towards an automotive degree, but then in the future do an MBA or you know, yep. in my hand at, at trying some things, well, we'll see. So 
it was very much a, a factor of like going out, asking questions, using kind of the, the engineering approach, which is if you can kind of see what the output or the final result needs to be, in some cases you can reverse engineer enough to, totally. you can, you know, um, and so I love talking to people too. That I think that was one of my biggest gifts, even growing your up. Superpower. Yeah, man, that's your superpower. I, yeah, I I love getting along with people, and then you know maybe I'm a little too optimistic. Where one of my other solid superpowers is also like I see the best, or I try to see the best. So you know if they come to me with an idea or something, or like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, I'll be like, oh hell yeah, let's do this. Let you know the X Y Z, because maybe it's sometimes it's a it's usually a bad habit too like my wife hates it but you know it for me i i don't know i love seeing patterns i love seeing how things kind of connect and, and dude i i i hate this mirror because like that's me to a like to a t and people are like i almost feel bad because like all i read and i have a friend and they took their they took every app like every social media or news app off their phone like totally removed it and I realized how much happier they were or just not like scared or stressed or kind of like whatever. I was thinking, you know, I'm reading all these stories about 1% make, you know, everybody fails in the startup. Nobody makes it, whatever, whatever. But for some reason, brother, like, especially like my, in the incubator, Matt, you know, that's going to go into startup as one of the programs, the accelerator, every, all 33, I was like, best idea ever. Let's, <laughs> let's rock. And like, what I did was I would kind of do exactly what I would see patterns, but the patterns and I think this is the same as you. They're industry agnostic. They're not like, oh, I'm only seeing computers. Or you can see it like in clouds or like you can see the business side of patterns in, in cannabis, in marketing, in health and digital wellness. Like you can see, hey, business is business. It doesn't have to be extremely focused on like one like iteration. So that's really cool. And it's actually a great segue if that's personality wise, past in school. And then and then where are you like, all right, man, next step? Because um, yeah. And that's still a heavy load from what your dad was doing as an engineer. And yeah, my mom too, she, uh, she grew up. Um, so she did her master's in anatomy and physiology from Pakistan. My dad has his uh, master's in mechanical engineering from university of Kentucky. So for me, it was always kind of like my, my family is huge on education. So they were always like, okay, you're going to go study. You're going to go do your, your undergrad and then finally eventually your master's. <clears throat> but um, when I being in the engineering kind of school or uh, I, I had a lot of close friends who helped me graduate. And so I found my fit there as also being kind of like their personal assistant, because I was always kind of like, I not personal as technically, <laughs> I was never technically strong. Like I was always like, okay, you know, if we need to put these together or so-and-so can work on this, let's you know, yep. uh, kind of packaging it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, like even my my senior uh, design project at college, um, my see my it was three of my closest friends who uh, were part of my fraternity as well as people who I'd been in college from day one, and then one random guy who ended up becoming one of our closest friends. Um, they unanimously made me like the project lead because they were like, okay, this guy is crazy enough to just make sure everybody gets He'll it. He'll figure it out. Yep. And we liked each other enough to where, you know, it was never annoying. It was never like, hey, you got to get this done or you're not pulling your weight. So I got very lucky in that regard. Um, and then, so I, my real kind of foray into entrepreneurship started like my, so I took the six year path in college. I should have graduated in four years. I was on track things happen in life, you know, uh, a couple of different in my family and whatnot, where I just kind of became a mess. Um, started drinking a lot, you know, a little few drugs here and there and just wasn't in the right frame of mind. So I started kind of failing classes, uh, hanging out, going into debt, thinking, you know, finding love from people through a bottle, right. Um, and so my when I finally started kind of getting out of it. It took me about a year, year and a half. I finally started getting out of it and started like my grades uh, got, or or I, I passed a couple of classes which were being troublesome. Um, a friend of mine, uh, he was also a fraternity brother of mine from UCLA. He and I really connected. Um, you know, he was also going through a tough time. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, so one day he was just visiting San Jose. I remember this, it was like beginning of uh, like 2010. 
was um, like my my junior year of college. And um, he was like, uh, The Social Network had come out, the movie. And we had watched that together and we're like, you know, hey, that's pretty cool. Like startups. And obviously we knew that they were like kind of glorifying it, but we're like, let's give it a shot. Like he was an electrical engineer. I was a mechanical engineer. So we just decided that day that, you know, let's uh, come up with a problem to solve and let's see if we can uh, come up or find something to work on together. And that actually led to us just, um, Trying thinking about shit. things. No, just thinking about things, right? Like he went back to UCLA and it, what ended up happening was that his mother was diagnosed with a terminal illness at the time. And she was also a very, like she was a, a software engineer too, I believe. And Jeez. so going from, you know, eight, 10 hours in front of a computer screen and keyboard to now not being able to use any electronic devices watching yeah. the hospital. Brutal. That, that became the problem. He, uh, so my buddy Grant, he comes back to me and he's like, hey, Seth, like hospitals don't trust electrical equipment or, or smartphones because it could interfere, right? Just like the on airplanes. Like, on why airplane. don't we create our own kind of mini computer? At the time, Apple hadn't come out with the iPad. There were no like small tablets or what. <clears throat> why don't we just see if we can hack together our own, go plug it into the hospital's private network and then sell them or sell the patients, you know, airtime or access on the internet and we just went down uh near downtown san jose there were a couple of these hobby stores we found like a small uh, lcd panel a couple like uh, uh there was a, a tiny micro uh or keyboard and then we had um kind of a pen mouse uh if you've ever seen the bone collector where denzel washington is laying in the in the bed and using that, yeah. that same kind of concept so we were like, regardless if the patient can use his hands, his or her hands, if they're able to use the, the piece or they're able to use the mouse, right? They're able to kind of use it. And then we were like, we can plug in just one small browser and maybe add um, like a Skype connectivity for future reference because most of our customers wanted that. Um, yeah, so we built that out. Um, he and like, uh, Grant and I both put, I think, like 500 bucks. We were just having fun um, and went and built out this tiny prototype, just made it, it. It didn't really work, but it showed enough of the vision to where yeah. uh, I would just be on LinkedIn. So would he. Uh, we would reach out to different uh, clinics in the area and just ask them, like, hey, if you're having this problem, we have a potential solution. Can we come over? Hey, can we come over and, and show it to you? And uh, we made this little like uh, kind of agreement to say that you know you can sign us up for this much. Um, so we we ended up kind of going around. That's how I uh, on LinkedIn I was just networking with people left and right and pulling the student card because we we were still students at the time and going out for coffee and uh, meeting a lot of like advisors and whatnot. And this took me through uh, graduation, um, and that is when. Uh, the uh, iPad came out. And so we had like two or three, you know, customers who had signed a small MOU saying, yes, we're going to work with you and pay you this much once you get like a couple more yeah. prototypes. And they're like, oh, for the same amount, we're getting iPads for the office. So sorry. I'm like, all right. And, you know, Grant went back to UCLA. He was still finishing up. I was like, oh, shit, I just graduated. I had my first taste of kind of, um, you know, failure, but it didn't hit me as badly because it was like, hey, it was just like a side project. We were having yeah. uh, having fun. Um, there's an awesome VC who I met who we're going to invite uh, on the podcast too. It was my first VC meeting, which was amazing. Like, uh, he, he was one of the most direct kind of like VC meetings you could ever expect, especially for a pre-revenue, pre-product, pre-anything company. He put us in our place very respectfully, but in such a way where I was like, okay, this is, you know, you can get out of that meeting with two kind of attitudes. One is that, oh my God, he, he sucked. He didn't listen to us. He's wrong, blah, blah, blah. The other was, okay, in between all the zingers and all the, you know, kind of punches to, to the gut, there is a lot of good feedback there. So let's focus on that. And that is basically what he wants before he invests, right? So that is kind of, that, that first meeting instilled that kind of attitude in me since then. So even if I ever have a really bad meeting, I always know like, okay, there was something in there, like a little tidbit I can take out. <laughs> can you like just pause? Yeah. 
that is so legit. That's so legit, man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're going through this, and you you understand this completely. Ed. That is so legit, and I always come out doo doo faced. And for what reason? That's so lame of me, man. Yeah. Well, always. I, I mean, take notes. Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. Um, even even in the cookie cutters instances, right? Then you can kind of understand. I have to hold myself back sometimes because the cookie cutter advice can seem can turn me off in such a way where I'll stop listening. Um, yeah. but in, in other cases, it's always like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm here listening to you because of, a, I asked for the meeting and then B I'm asking for this feedback for you to tear my company, my pitch, whatever, a new one so I can improve. Right. So, um, it's, it's just, yeah, I've always treated it as an attitude thing. <laughs> hmm. I mean, that's really, really hard. Cause most founders are like, they, they're not this humble. I really don't think they are. Well, so most founders are also a lot more successful than us. Let's you know, call it a spade a spade, as you say. So, um, you know, and and um, that that's kind of where, like, now I kind of am positioning myself as just, you know, hey, a personal assistant to awesome founders because I feel like that's where I can I can kind of provide the most value instead of even as we go across or go hmm. down the list of, of things I've done. If you look at it, there have only been maybe so four startups where I came up with the idea, but only two of them were actually like B2B SaaS apps. Two of them, one was the accelerator, one was the fund. So I like Pinfluence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You always have, so some, actually, have some really interesting ones. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, um, so well, so this first one was called Denicom. Uh, we never incorporated Ooh. anything. It was just like I said, a side project where we built the, that product. But for we worked on it for about a year and about let's say three or four months, and that is actually what led me. <laughs> that is what led me to the next company called Nerditorium, which was. What is this shit? <laughs> this is awesome, dude. <laughs> so, so the Nerditorium, Nerditorium funny that's story. That's so good. That's so yes. good. So the founders of the Nerditorium are Cedric Dahl and Ben Hoffman. Amazing. Uh, um, founders from so from the east coast but so cedric and shane one of their other friends who was with them at the time were both betas from uh from the east coast they were visiting san jose after selling uh, so after cedric and ben they used to work for microsoft sold some company to microsoft had done very well for themselves and were now kind of uh ha enjoying themselves right before figuring out what's next so they were visiting san jose on this um uh, they were doing a spy class uh, because they had plans to travel around the world and there were some security kind of conferences and stuff happening. So they showed up on uh, on the campus. I used to smoke cigarettes at the time. So I was always kind of outside, uh, out front of the fraternity house, just hanging out. And it just so happened I was outside when they walked in. So I just connected with them while they were there that entire week. I was like driving them back and forth. They told me more about their startup and what they had done. And I was just like, I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. I'm also working on something and I call you guys for feedback. And so while I was working on Denicom, these guys had kind of, it, it had been like four or five months since our first meeting, but I had, I used to call them up every like month and a half, two months, just been like, hey, how's it going? What are you guys working on? Sounds awesome. How can I help? How can I help? Um, and then, so after, uh, uh, ben had actually contacted me and been like, hey, I, uh, you had reached out a couple months ago about your startup. How's it going? And I was like, oh, funny you ask. Well, I just shut it down. I'm interviewing uh, you know, for mechanical engineering jobs. Let me know if you can, if you know of anything. And so Ben and Cedric at the time had just moved to Austin, Texas and had planned to create their own kind of art and tech incubator or micro budget incubator, which is called the Nerditorium. In a nutshell, it was a hacker house that they were going to rent out and invite oh, friends yeah. to go build, right. build it. You call it the Nerditorium, huh? They did, yeah. It was an That's awesome house, dude. In, in Austin, we were like maybe five, ten miles, uh, less than ten miles out of downtown. Gorgeous house. And, That's cool. um, it's kind of, you know, we worked during the day and we used to hang out together. It was uh, my, so Ben said we had our own chef called Papa, ba Papa Ben. 
Um, there's a YouTube video I have with him, uh, smoking a brisket. Then there's, um, <laughs> uh, then there's, um, uh, uh, there was Paul, there was Jacob, we had Ellie, um, you know, just, just, it was just amazing. So one of the first projects that they had me kind of come up and that was my first foray into being a generalist. Uh, they gave me that title. They were like, Hey, we just don't want to put you in a bucket. Just figure it out. Right. And I was like, okay, cool. That's a mechanical engineering in me. Um, so first project I utterly failed at, which was, um, so before smartphones had good cameras in them, a lot of amateur photographers used to go in the woods and take their DSLR cameras, but they need an extra remote to take time-lapse videos. Cedric and Ben decided like, oh, there's a way using the microphone port in your cameras to trigger a remote so that you can replace the remote with your phone. And we would just sell it as an app. So uh, an app with a tiny kind of adapter. So I worked on that for about a month, month and a half, didn't work. Um, the second project though was, um, uh, so these guys had raised money on Kickstarter for to create, to shoot their own independent movie about the beauty of parkour. This is 2010 when parkour is blowing up. They went to Burning Man. They raised $10,000 on Kickstarter, used it to fund all their equipment and stuff. So this is an amazing story. Um, so I got lucky where, so I joined the team right after they got back from Burning Man. So I was helping a little with post-production, but I was responsible for just contacting universities and trying to get parkour clubs to hold screenings um, for oh, our, really? our athletes and uh, of the movie. So um, the movie is still around actually. <laughs> really beautiful. Like if you're ever into parkour and into that movement, um, definitely worth a watch. Mm -hmm. um, but then the, the project that I was most interested in was, so at the time the Joe Rogan Experience podcast was around, but wasn't as popular. We had a very small kind of niche community. Um, podcasting was, just wasn't as popular at the time. But what Cedric and Ben properly or understood well was that these guys, the average episode can go like two hours long. And when that happens, um, you can forget about what's being said. Um, you know, and there's no way for you to go back or see online what, what was spoken about. So they decided to create their own website called Podly, where we would basically create a living database of whatever was referred to on each episode. So the first 350 episodes of the Joe Rogan Experience podcast from start to finish, I listened to, I transcribed, not transcribed everything, but basically anything that was a proper noun, tagged it to a category and a website, whether it was an Amazon affiliate, eBay, it was Wikipedia, et cetera. So any MMA fighter, any drug he mentioned, any book, any TV show, any UFC, you know, anything. Um, and put it onto the website using uh, Cedric's engine. And that was a lot of fun. We thought um, it would go well, but um, I was with the Nerditorium for about a year, a year and, and some change before Cedric and Ben decided that as an experiment, the Nerditorium didn't work for him. And they had, they're had they known as legends in the uh, crypto community now because of the actions they took after, which was they created what, uh, one of the first kind of crypto companies called Buttercoin, um, mining, et cetera. Like they're, they're very well known for that. So they moved on um, and I was just kind of left again, like, okay, um, what to do? So... At the time, I just so happened to be visiting Pakistan. Um, it had been a couple of years, uh, my grandparents and stuff I hadn't seen. So I decided to take like a couple or maybe a month off, just go visit. And then when I was going to come back, work or focus on the job search. So while I was there, one of my cousins or older cousins, he's one of my my biggest supporters in entrepreneurship. Um, so he his a lot of his his high school friends and college friends were in the country working in tech in some form or another and he was like introducing me to everyone he could as his little brother from san jose or from silicon valley and so one of his really good friends his name is Junaid Iqbal, who ended up becoming the managing or one of the managing directors for kareem in the middle east uh, which was sold to uber for i think like oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Million. um big car share car writing uh the car share thing car share thing, company yeah and so, uh, Janet, yeah, they were, you know, but didn't they have like a fraud? Yeah, whatever. Dang, not sure. Um, yeah. uh, well, I mean, the company's still around, so it's just yeah. Uber in the Middle East. Um, oh. 
And so uh, Janet was nice enough to, to introduce me to um, uh, this gentleman named Zafar, who was working in, in, the U in Pakistan, but he had a partner in the US um, named Carlos Cashman. Uh, these guys were incognito e-commerce gurus, like SEO, just you name it, they could do. They were already doing like tens of millions of dollars. Does that stuff make a difference? Yes, very much so. Um, and it, if you need to do it correctly, otherwise it can actually hurt you in the lungs. Um, and and I, this coming from somebody who um, saw these guys handle like like unicorns when they were like seed Series A companies. Um, so yeah, it's it, it the right people matter. Mm -hmm. So I I got lucky where so uh, Zephyr was like okay. Um, uh, my buddy Carlos is in in the Bay Area. When you go back, go meet him. So when I came back, I, I connect with him on the phone, and Carlos is like, "Listen, we've just invested in this startup called Pinfluence. Um, you know, it's it's pre pre seed. Uh, it's just one person, uh, Taylor, the CEO, and then we have an engineering team in Pakistan. Why don't you uh, don't put in some hours as a consultant or contractor and see if it works?" So he put me in touch with with Taylor. Excuse me. And Taylor is this amazing woman from, from the East Coast, uh, New York City, who <clears throat> was just a hustler. She met Carlos at a coffee shop, pitched him Pinfluence at the coffee shop, and basically got a seed round that way, like That's a small good. round. Um, and so the idea was that at the time, Pinterest was blowing up. Uh, I think it was like 80% women users, but had a big bra problem, whatever. It was still in its infancy. So Taylor rightfully so said that there were big brands who wanted to target the female demographic on Pinterest, but didn't know how to run their campaigns or how to manage their campaigns, how to add followers. Um, and this is, again, 2011, um, when, you know, before Twitter, before all these kind of like um, social platforms or or any yeah. engines or software to, to run um, on them, right? So um, Taylor basically came up with a hack uh, that she trained the engineers of Pakistan to run a script to run hundreds of searches in parallel and then scrape all those followers for a brand. Like it was, it was absolutely genius. And that was the prototype. Like she built the prototype with the team uh, with using Carlos's team very fast. And that's around the time when I came on. Um, so when I came on board, she was able to just focus on, um, customer development and, and uh, sales. And I was uh, taking her vision, working on kind of uh, going from 0 0.1 to version 1.0 that we would actually put into the hands of some some big customers that she had like. So um, that was- um, That's more like CPG stuff, marketing? Uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, they would, at the time, keyword, uh, you know, keyword Kind of planning Searches. was really big yeah, yeah yeah so you know we would just reverse engineer from there um and keep it super simple where they would just give us a list and we would put it in our system and um just it, it would be automatic like we were adding hundreds of thousands of followers for some of our brands and eventually taylor being as amazing as she is she networked her way into Condé Nas like head office in new york city Condé Nas owns like 70 percent of all magazines around the world all the magazine brands uh, she did the same thing with Best Buy. She did the same thing with Victoria's Secret marketing team. And they all gave us a shot. So it would be, we would meet their teams. We would get a list of keywords and, and kind of target demographics for them. And that's it. We tell them, that's all you need to give us. We were, we're going to show you. We were in that beta. What period. was your ROI usually there? Um, so it was, at, so at the time, it wasn't very much, uh, so e-commerce capabilities were limited in terms of taking the link off of the platform and trying to sell them. So it was very much so like, how many likes do we get? How many followers do we get? You know, what kind of engagement and clicks and stuff. But it totally. was never later down the funnel um, until we until the next one. Um, and so for Pinfluence, it was very much like, okay, we're going to give you um, uh, a simple software that you can pay us for like a monthly SaaS. And then uh, for accessing the software. But if you want us to run your account, uh, your brand for you or manage it for you, which we were doing on the B2B side, then they were going to pay us a little more. So we were in that beta test. It's a good model. Period. So, I mean, Taylor, uh, and, and she came up with this entirely from like on her own. So um, I, I had nothing to do with that. I was, again, very much her personal assistant. And 
Um, I, I got fortunate where I think within like two weeks of starting as like on the contract side, she was, we got along so well. She was like, Seth, I love you. Join me full time on this. Let's, let's do this together. Um, so we worked on Pimps Wins kind of, uh, you know, full time really, like if we put like 40, 60 hours in there um, a week uh, for about a year and a half. And then something bad happened. So the uh, Aurora High School shooting happened in 2012 yeah, in yeah, yeah, Colorado. And um, so at the time, Pinterest also had a huge spam problem, like bot problem. Everybody knew it, but they were kind of, they never did anything really inappropriate. So nobody cared. Well, that day, um, because we're adding, like on an average month, I was adding maybe half a million, new, or not half a million, but roughly 100,000 new followers for a decent campaign. Right or so. I think um, Kanye Nas, one of their magazine profiles, like their their official profile on Pinterest, was adding followers like crazy. Like, and as part of it, anytime they would tell us like, "Hey, advertise this image or advertise this article, etc." We would just do that. Well, it turns out a lot of the spams that day started sharing a lot of inappropriate imagery around gun violence, and so it became this big thing. I was with my team up all night long, like trying to like go in, delete. We basically had to restart their entire campaigns from scratch. Um, but we lost a lot of trust as well. It was very difficult for the team. Um, our investors also kind of said no to, you know, any future support and whatnot. And we were kind of left, you know, to dry. Um, and yeah, we, at that point then pinned, uh, so Taylor also decided to move on. Um, I, we, so I found out later on, and I guess it doesn't really matter anymore, but I was the only person to get paid um, at that time for whatever reason, right? And I was fine with working on equity. So because of that scenario, and so Scott, who was the third partner uh, with Suffer and Carlos in their firm, um, he had heard about me and he was like, listen, I'm, I'm toying with this idea for a marketing uh, kind of agency. Um, I know you're free. Oh, yeah. I know you're working, um, you know, for Pinfluence. Pin why don't you, you know, give me a couple hours uh, a week and I can pay you something. It's like, all right, you know, obviously, like anything I can do to get paid. Um, it ended up being where I was working anywhere, like, let's say 12 to 7, 12 to 6 with Scott. And then from 6 to 4 a.m., because in Pakistan, the hours are like 12 hours ahead. I was working 6 to 9 p.m. with Taylor and then from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. with our engineers and designers in Pakistan. I mean, I loved it though, like 60, whatever. Uh, I was I was living at home. This was like a, a year, year and a half after college. So I didn't care. I was working on an awesome startup with awesome people. Um, and so when Pinterest, after like a year of that, when I, I saw it on with Scott, um, when Pinfluence, uh, when Pinfluence shut down, it had been like a couple of months with, with Scott and what ended up becoming Orion CKB, which is a performance marketing agency. So Scott uh, was based out of Boston and Scott and Carlos uh, originally was based out of Boston. Carlos moved to the Bay Area later on. Um, these guys had some awesome connections with like ad, like hardcore ad tech startups in Boston. And one of them was called Nanigans. So the way, the best way to show- Called what? Are, it's called Nanigans. Um, the easiest way to describe Nanigans is to say, if you've ever run a Facebook ads using the Facebook ads manager, you know that, or until a couple of years ago, you know that every unique variation of the ad, you would have to plug in one at a time. With Nanigans software, or basically, yeah, the tool that we had, I could run hundreds of thousands of unique variations of an ad within minutes, like just uh, by clicking a couple of, of buttons. Um, so, and, and Nanigans was one of uh, Facebook's first ever API uh, or API partners. This is 2012 mm -hmm. again. So a year after Facebook ads launched, we were already running Facebook ads. And so it was just myself and Scott. Scott was That's plugged like in. He stuff would, right there. Yeah, he would be, uh, he and Carlos had a phenomenal network. They would find startups uh, at the beginning and they would convince him like, hey, we can run your Facebook ads for you. And it would literally be intro call with me. I would then figure out what their target audience was. I would figure out what kind of images, if they had any. If they don't, let's try to work on building them for you. I used to do the copy myself. And I was only 24, 25 at the time. Um, so when we started Orion CKB, it started off very slow. So the first six months was like 
a few hundred or a few thousand dollar kind of campaigns. We the the easiest money we ever made at the time was cost per like. We had some people who used to pay us ten dollars per like on their Facebook pages. Ten dollars per like at the time. It was so it's such easy money. And it's not like oh. we were hustling anybody either. We would just tell them like, you know, these are the at the time it was like your your CPAs were really likes. They were some forms of engagement, usually clicks. And most companies hadn't gotten further down the funnel in terms of you know tracking purchases and stuff. Nanigans did. So we had that superpower for our agency. We were exclusively licensed with, with Nanigans. Scale? Yep. We were the only agency in the world allowed to use Nanigans software. Other like so we took complete advantage of that. And then our next superpower came in Brad Goldberg, who was used to work at Nanigans when they were still an early stage company. He worked with them a couple years, moved on, decided to open up a bar in downtown Boston. Awesome guy. Um, and he, like Scott basically was like, okay, we can run a lot of these smaller scale campaigns ourselves or, or using staff. I never got any training. But if we want to run any large scale, like $50,000, $100,000 a month in advertising, we need somebody bit bigger. And that's where Brad came in. And as soon as Brad came in, I think so six months after um, after the, it had started, we had upped our minimum ad spend from like nothing, really. We had some customers doing like $5,000 a month. We had some customers who barely touched like the $20,000 a month mark. We increased our digital marketing or minimum ad spend to $10,000 a month per client. Hmm. And we were not going to talk to unless it's anything less. And because we used to charge a percentage of, of the spend. Of spend. Six months, yeah. Six months after that, with Brad's help, we increased our minimums to $100,000 a month. Shit, dude, a 10X? Flying. And um, like Scott uh, Scott got a small office. I was remote in, in the Bay. Um, uh, Scott got an office out in Medford in, in uh, Massachusetts. Brad was out there, started getting like a couple other people involved. And with the, the company was just flying like crazy. So that was a lot of fun. I was able to kind of see firsthand, not only, uh, so Carlos has his own awesome kind of background, MIT grad, but also in the dot-com era, he was kind of a young founder who um, who sold an edutech company, um, did very well for himself, kind of did some other interesting things along the way. And so I got a really good chance to learn from them. Scott was my first mentor. Um, so I was with Orion CKB and with, with their group as a whole for a, a roughly three years. Um, and in the trenches, right? Like spending anywhere from like 60, 80 hours a week together. Uh, so got to learn a lot. Um, but then after about two and a half years, it was kind of time for me to, to move on for different reasons. And so that's where, um, so, so, uh, it, so it's August of 2014, right? And at this point, this is the day when it's my last day at Orion CKB and along this is kind of where my product manager had splits. So when, because of my experience with the, with Nerditorium, right? And incubators, that was my first foray into startup program. And actually Cedric and Ben also after the Nerditorium got into Y Combinator. So I was like, okay, this is pretty awesome. I decided I wanted to start my own meetup group because I was really good at going on LinkedIn, finding interesting people and asking them to come and speak. And because of my fraternity uh, background at San Jose State, I still had access to rent free classrooms on campus. Yeah. So when I, after the Nerditorium, when I first, uh, with, uh, with Pinfluence, when that started, I was like, okay, even I didn't know Jack as a founder, right? Or as a young founder. So I was like, okay, I need help. And so I used the meetup group or, uh, or renting, reserving a room on campus. Rooms to find people who I would then ask questions for. And then I just went to all the student clubs, like any business entrepreneurship engineering ones, and to their student, like all their information is online. Um, I would just scrape them, put in an Excel sheet, and then one by one email them copy paste template and saying, I'm having this free event this day. I'm just gonna bring some like, like you know, pizza and, and some waters. Um, and we're gonna be talking about these things. Uh, and it would usually be like one guest speaker. Uh, our first one ever was actually somebody who was talking about body language. Um, so mm -hmm. it would always be like one topic for the That's audience. Cool. 
one topic would be like startup or investor related. And then I would open up the floor for any founders there who want to talk about their company and get some feedback. Um, so the first event that uh, we or I hosted was like um, winter of 2010 or early 2011. Um, and then slowly, like I used to run it every two weeks. This on clockwork every two weeks, uh, it slowly started growing. And then within a few months, I found who would become my eventual co-founders there because it was pretty evident that there were no incubators in San Jose at the time. If there were, they were kind of like small. Uh, most of the, the hype was going to San Francisco, to Stanford and stuff. And San Jose State, even though they had their own entrepreneurship kind of um, com like clubs and organizations, they were all yeah. siloed in their own buildings. Whereas I was just a random like alumni who, or alumnus who would just you you know do my own events. So eventually we got support from the city of San Jose and San Jose State to turn it into an incubation center. Um, it was uh, they the city had already uh, provided support to it's called the U.S. Market Access Center. They had uh, um, a place in downtown. We ended up getting one of their floors for free. Um, so use that to just like host events really any uh we partnered with all the local community colleges all uh stanford berkeley um any other ucs that wanted to and we're just like anybody who's an underrepresented founder and you know if you don't feel like you're getting the resources or support that you need come to us like we don't care who you are um that was kind of the spartan mentality too because we knew we were under underrated but most of us most of our student body was working like two, three jobs at a time. We're very hard workers. So we kind of brought that same mentality and we called the incubation center Spartups for that reason. So I, I ran Spartups like uh, part-time until this point, right? So so it's August, 2014 now. And I've been running Spartups like kind of as a side project, just, you know, every couple of weeks. And and um, at this at this point, my co-founders at Spartups, Rand and Emeka, um, we're like, okay, we want to ramp this up. We think there's an opportunity here. There's YC, there's 500 startups and stuff. We're, we, we're not, we want to be like a pre-accelerator. We want to funnel people over to them because we're the idiots, but we think we can just gather resources and give enough uh, support to young companies and founders to where if they do well, then we can kind of funnel them into like Founders Institute, et cetera. Um, so... Now that I've left Ryan CKB, I'm like, okay, we're, we're, we launched our, our kind of formal accelerator program, which we just reverse engineers from tech stars, from YC, from 500 startups, because all their program information was online. Uh, and we're like, okay, this is the topic. We need to find people who can talk about this stuff and just invite them. So that's how our, like, at the time, it was like a 12-week kind of accelerator program. Um, our first batch was... It was like nine or ten startups. We gave them free space, uh, free co-working space, free access. Uh, we didn't charge them anything. Um, eventually, we got a two percent warrant, um, but I I forgo uh, forgave those uh, later on when we decided to shut down, which I'll get to in a second. But um, hmm. so I'm I'm doing so we we launched the accelerator program. It's still like winter of 2014. I then am reaching out to different LPs, asking them like, hey, we got these awesome companies, you know. Would you ever want to come and speak to him? Uh, um, and uh, when I was okay. doing that, when I was doing that, um, I ended up meeting the CEO of Smash On, who had just raised a small million dollar seed round to create a B2B health and wellness startup mm -hmm. around um, like connecting uh, people to your local health and wellness kind of uh, resource. And so he, uh, I, I got along with Taz, uh, Taz, the CEO very well. And he was like, listen, I know you're doing, um, uh, you're doing startups, and I had also kind of launched another startup called Compass at the time with my my the same Rand and one of our portfolio company CEO Stephen. Um, the idea behind it was that when we were in digital marketing, uh, both Rand and I, we used that we never found any examples of good ads that had been run. So we were like, why don't we try to come up with a depository where uh, we take examples of good ads and their engagement and provide that as a database for people the against template. like a monthly against a monthly kind of subscription right 
Um, yeah. So we we built that overnight at Angel Hack. Improve the ROI of that copy and content. I would absolutely pay for that. I would right? absolutely pay for that. Yeah. yeah. And and well, the our use case was you put your competitors stuff in there and be able to see like what's working, what isn't, right? Be able to level the the playing field. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we we built that over, uh, at Angel Hack. Um, it's a hackathon uh, at PayPal, like overnight. Um, built that to a pretty fun product. Like Steven was our our CTO, an awesome developer. But so I'm I'm doing some uh, startups and I'm doing like a uh, compass or it, it was get compass. And then Taz is like, listen, I need help. Uh, he was burning like I think fifty thousand a month on engineering. Uh, product hadn't like released. It had been a couple months, and he was like, "Listen, I'm spending way too much time on this. I need somebody to just handle it." And I was like, "Okay, I can do it, but I need my autonomy." I had some reservations from the previous companies about like you know contracts and NDAs and non competes. I was like, "I don't want any of that because you know this is my trajectory." That I told them I wanted to become a VC, and I was building startups into a certain thing. It was like, I completely support you. I want you to do this with me. And he was giving me the equity and everything that I wanted. I was like, all right. So I'm, I'm doing three things at this point. Compass was kind of a side project because Steven had automated everything where my job was really like sometimes on the phone for new, comp uh, for new people, new users, just kind of explaining how it worked or just handling support emails. It was, it was a very sweet deal. Um, so we're doing this smash on uh, when I joined um uh so within about three months we built the product out there's actually a youtube video i think i shared uh, the demo with you um and we used that prototype or not the prototype the v1 to partner with uh, whole foods in the bay area um uh and safeway uh so the idea was that they were going to have us custom label our app for them and use it to promote health and wellness initiatives uh or local initiatives for their customers Similarly, we white or we custom labeled it for uh, Genentech as well, who wanted to uh, offer it to their own employees. They have like thirty thousand employees in the Bay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? In um, to be, yeah, everything in house, and for us to basically match them with health and wellness kind of resource. So that company, it it was kind of going cruising along, but then we ran out of money. It's twenty fifteen, kind of like um like summer twenty fifteen, and. Uh, we had to we had to let go of a lot of people. It was about thirty people on on the team. Uh, we ended up with like five who were on the kind of ex executive team. And we're like, okay, how we all love the company. We all wanted to see it succeed. So we decided like we're all gonna figure out our own things, how to survive, um, but we're still gonna put in time and effort. And we kept trying to fundraise. We kept trying to like I was still working with Genentech and some of these other companies to to fulfill the beta and the trials, but. Um, uh, that's when I ended up getting a contract with F50.io, which is kind of a VC tool uh, organization community. The founder, David, uh, he had created uh, one of the largest meetup groups for entrepreneurship in the Bay Area. It was called Silicon Valley Entrepreneurs. And when I joined, or uh, so he needed a consultant, basically uh, an event manager uh, to not only run the meetup community, host events, but then also help with like some other things that they were cooking, which um, uh, like a big conference. So um, I was very fortunate because like, the, I got a part-time contract, which paid me very well. I was able to still, you know, get, fulfill my commitments to Spartups, to Compass, to Smash On, and I'm doing F50 now. And uh, so Silicon Valley Entrepreneurs was a lot of fun. It was, in a nutshell, I used to host one event a week, but every week would be in a different location in the Bay Area. So once a week was in San Francisco. Another week would be in Oakland, another week in San Jose, another week in Menlo Park, for example. And um, it would, I would be, from start to finish, the event was mine. Uh, I used to, uh, it was my own network. I used to, or I would find new people on LinkedIn, investors. Uh, each event would be two speakers. So, um, so two topics, a panel of three investors, and then at least five startups from seed or series A seed, uh, stage to come and present. Um, so it was a lot of fun. We used to partner with like WeWork and and do it all around. They used to sponsor all the food and drinks. Um, I did that for about six months uh, with F50. Um, it really kind of uh, kind of connected me with a lot of the the VC associate side because that's where they were focusing. And uh, one of the events uh, in Google I/O in 2015, F50 was a partner um, for that event. 
So I was able to kind of host a couple of events there where we hosted a 200 company job fair. So start 200 startups in San Francisco on the pier. Holy um, shit, dude. Where over a two day period, uh, you know, uh, the, the job fair was entirely mine uh, to set up. So I was very proud of that. Um, but then the, the funded event uh, itself, we did a fantastic job. So at this point, though, I am kind of also starting to burn out. It had been, I think, five or six months with that 50. They gave me an offer to join full time, but I, I wasn't into it. I really wanted to see Spartup succeed, which is still my number one kind of priority. And um, so Smash On isn't really going anywhere. I'm, I'm burning out there. Compass at this stage, I didn't feel like I was giving too much. So I actually told my co-founders like, hey, I don't feel like I can give you 100%. So I think it's best if I just kind of walk away. Um, and there were no hard feelings. I still love the guys. Like we're still in touch and stuff. But um, I walked away from Compass. Um, I walked away from Smash On. Spartups, I had been desperately trying to raise money and trying to keep afloat and trying to be like, you know, this is going to like be able to to sustain me and, and afford me a life, it, it didn't though. So in like around late 2015 is when I kind of went through another reset, let's say, where I was like, you know, I I, I was young and to the point where I'm, you know, at Orion CKB and Pinfluence, I'm, I'm juggling multiple clients and multiple kind of fires. Uh, later on, I'm trying to do multiple companies thinking I have all this energy. Now I'm like, listen, the next thing I got to do, I got to focus on one thing and I got to make it big. Like there's, there's, uh, I, I didn't believe anymore in like, you know, until you, you get successful, then you can have your, your hands in multiple things, but otherwise focus on one thing as a problem. Um, so I, I got very fortunate where around that time, uh, Orion CKB actually got acquired. So about a, maybe a year after I had left. So because of my affiliation with them, the first like one third of their or two thirds of their existence, I was I got, you know, I was able to kind of tell people like, hey, this was a company I was part of the founding team of. They got acquired uh, by Elite SEM. And this is what I've been doing separately. I've built products and I love building programs for founders. So um, the natural thing for me was to become was to look into early stage VC. So I've been trying to raise in the U.S., you know, everywhere. It just didn't seem like it was going to happen. We did get an offer, and I'm going to bring him on board too, Tony, um, Tony, uh, Shao, uh, Tony Shu. But um, uh, it just so happened then that I decided again, like I need to take a break. I need to kind of take a step back, and I ended up visiting Pakistan uh, again. It was my cousin's wedding, so. I had a two month open ticket. I'm like, I'm going to go relax. I'm going to go see friends, family, party. When I get there, I'm like, you know, they, uh, I was connecting with a lot of friends and people and they're like, hey, there's startups and there's this ecosystem over here. You got to check it out. And um, I had been working somewhat with the local incubators and accelerators from afar being in the Bay. So I was like, OK, I'm going to go visit the three major cities and go visit these places and, and kind of see what's going on. If there's any VCs or angel investors, anybody interested. And what I when I was going around, there was like kind of, you know, Silicon Valley and even maybe early Seattle, uh, early tech hubs where you, know, you get a lot of predatory investors. You get people offering you like tens of thousands of dollars for 89 percent equity saying like, oh, I'm going to take care and you need a CEO or you need an adult in the room. Blah, blah. Like all this BS. And um, you know, there there were some some big grifters over there. So I was just like, okay, there's an opportunity here where um because it, it seems like it's an it's early stage. So I felt like I could contribute um yeah. more so than some of the you know corporates and stuff over there who I didn't think had the best intentions for founders. Um so I, I was just going around and I was like, okay, there's there's some angel investors who I had heard had started making some small amounts. I went and connected. And that's how I found my eventual co-founder, Nadeem Hussain, who is an amazing guy. He was a Citibank um, executive team. He brought Citibank to Pakistan in the in the mid-90s. A huge bank, a big, very well-respected banker. Um, but then he himself decided uh, in the mid-2000s to create a microfinance bank for a country like Pakistan. And microfinance banking in, uh, in that region was kind of... Um, it was popularized in Bangladesh uh, by some some other like legendary banker, and Nadim was able to actually take 
some of parts of that model and turn it into a fintech app. Uh, which mm. is called Easy Pesa over there. Um, it kind of not really mimics PayPal or anything. It's completely different, but it's it's kind of bucketed in in the same. It's called the PayPal of Pakistan. Um, so he he Took went through that adoption. round exactly. So um, uh, the his microfinance bank and the app went off took off like crazy. And I got lucky when I met him. He had just actually uh, uh, signed the paperwork selling the company to Telenor Group out of Norway. Um, who were going to buy the bank and everything. And he had already started making inroads with some founders who had wanted to make into investments. In. So when I joined um, uh, or when I when I reached out to him, you know, he was like, OK, just come meet with the other guys. Uh, they had all known him a lot longer. I was just some random guy who showed up from, you know, from the Bay and was like, what's up? Um, and so we did. Is that how we, it went? Kind of. He, he's super cool. And he's going to be on the podcast, too. Uh, so you'll, you'll see his personality. But, um, you know, I for a couple months, just kind of going back and forth, he was like, take a look at some of these other companies I'm considering, have them review you as well. And and so I was his 11th actual angel investment. And the idea was that um, we so 70 percent of the population in Pakistan at the time was under the age of um, 30. And over 90% 4G Jesus. internet penetration. Like the internet connections there were faster than the what like Comcast Xfinity blew them away. Um, and so we were like, okay, there are all these universities, good pipeline of, of kids, and there's this underground network of consultants, like programmers and and contractors who are already doing like Fiverr and Upwork. So we were like, these guys might have ideas. Let's come up with our own accelerator program. Where we give them like ten thousand to twenty five thousand. That was our range for equity upfront. So we would become an early stage partner, and then the main fund, which is called Planet N Group, uh, which is uh, Nadim's, um, that was gonna be there for seed and Series A. So I was gonna be the CEO of the the accelerator initially. We raised a small amount there, and the idea was like let's do 10, 20 kind of batches every year. Um, but be, so I and so technically I was the eleventh investment of Planet N. But because of the nature of my work, right, every time Planet N used to get any kind of proposals or I would be going around trying to solicit, like, meet founders and stuff and consider them for pre-seed or seed kind of investment, eventually I uh, ended up becoming the chief of operations for Planet N and just kind of doing a dual role because it was the same thing, really. Um, and so we, uh, so Planet N started off as a very small fund. It started off with the name's own money. We were able to go out, raise some more money from local LPs. Um, we very much set it up as an export fund uh, because we were looking at um, uh, dual citizens like myself. So I hold the U.S. and Pakistani passport. There's so yeah. many others like that who are coming back to the country and being able to utilize that talent to build something. And export it, whether it's to the Middle East, to Asia, to Europe, or to the to North America. And so, um, when I was there uh, over the years, we did forty two investments. Um, I handled nineteen. I was the like board and um, kind of the the first contact for nineteen pre seed companies as part of the accelerator program. But then I was also part of the uh, other twenty three seed and Series A companies. I used to help them with investor relations. Um, I handled all the partnerships, so all the startup resources, all the grants, AWS, Facebook, Microsoft, credits, et cetera, um, and a lot of the um, invent, like portfolio programming. So if they needed, you know, uh, they're trying to hire specialists or if they're trying to find like somebody to do something very specific, I'd be like, hey, I can find somebody or I can ask around. So that's kind of where the concierge model that we're working in right now kind of comes from. So I, I, I was with Planet N for roughly four years in Pakistan. It was amazing time, amazing friendships, amazing people. But after four years, I decided, uh, so even Planet N, we were trying to build it as a VC fund. Uh, it was very difficult in a country where there were no VC rules, really. It was very difficult. And um, kind of the direction for the fund was going more into private equity. We had, he had some you know interested parties. And I was like, you know, I, I at that point also had decided I want to move back to the U.S. My entire family was here. I had moved purely out of a love to become a VC. Um, and I was staying with my relatives and stuff over there. And so I met my wife. So, um, you know, when when all of that was was done, I was like, OK, um, I'm done. I'm ready to go home and, uh, you know, go back to the Bay and see. I wanted to get back into the operations side. But unfortunately, 
it's uh, early 2020 now, um, COVID started and flights have shut down. And I'm sitting in Pakistan and I'm like, shit, like I want to move back, but now I need to figure out what to do. So that's actually kind of where I had started doing some consulting work. Um, and, um, you know, so uh, a buddy of mine, he's got this HR tech company called the Talent Games. So while I was in Pakistan, he was trying to uh, set get set up outside. Um, so I helped him kind of with the pitch uh, with some of the investor uh, relations stuff with you know the, the the data room and whatnot. He was able to kind of help me sustain myself for a few months. So I'm forever grateful. Um, then also I found Founders List, which uh, just randomly off of Reddit, the founder of Founders List, he had just posted saying, I'm building this uh, kind of community for founders and I'm looking for, for co-founders to help me with it. Um, so that's actually where I met uh, Rob and Chris, who would who were my original founders or co-founders for this, uh, startup studios. So the right. what happened at Founders List was basically like we made some contributions, uh, the three of us and the with the founder, and the founder didn't think that we contributed as much, so we decided you know it would it had been like four or five months of free work, and I was like okay I can't do anymore, and there was no indication of there being any like trust being exchanged. So three of us walked and um, that's where we were like, okay, you know, kind of similar, we can build it ourselves. So um, that's where, where Founders List kind of, uh, or sorry, Startup Studios part version one um, yeah. kind of came up, uh, about. So I'm building that out. I also tried Philip. Uh, this is a, a uh, an on-demand gas delivery in Pakistan. Um, Cause a lot of my family and my co-founder over there, his family owned a lot of petrol pumps. So we was like, okay, we can just put him in a, in a gallon container and a fuel container on the back of a bike. There are no like HEPA or sorry, any like OSHA or any security safety laws there. So let's do it. Um, we did about, we did actually about like 300 deliveries as the test. That's like, impressive. Uh, yeah. But it, it wasn't scalable. We were like, screw it. Like it wasn't, he, he's, he went on to do another awesome FinTech company. And um, I was being lured at the time by a couple of VC funds in Pakistan to possibly uh, start something, start another fund. Um, so one of them uh, was a friend of mine who was who I, who I thought um, he was like, Hey, I need a CEO. They were already kind of started, um, had kind of closed half of their fund. And I was like, you know, I can bring the American element. I have a network there. And, you know, again, the exporting aspect. Um, they wasted my time for about three months. And then there was another group, which huge family in, in Pakistan, like probably one of the top 10 richest families there. Um, they were already in VC, but they weren't happy with how things were going. So uh, they had started a separate conversation with me to create a $30 million like local fund. Um, using some of their existing kind of companies. So think, you know, if there was um, like if Unilever, right, with all their different kind of subsidies and corporations wanted to create their own fund um, using kind of a mix between cash and services. So that's what they had me um, kind of prepare for them. It got approved for the board and everything, but the the offer that they gave me to run it as CEO was just really low. So I decided like, no, thank you. And it, it to be honest, the, those two experiences, they happened within like six months of each other. Oh. They turned me off from VC so bad. And I was like, you know what? Screw this. I don't even need this. Like that's where kind of the ego came back. And where you asked like, you know, I, I was too American for Pakistan, right? Where, where I said, and that was kind of what I was, was happening there. So I was like, screw this. I don't need this. I can go back and find something like back home. So oh, it just... Yeah, so it point. it's uh, but it just so happens that so it's early 21, 21 at this point. My parents just got their second booster shot, and I was like, okay, I was here the the day after, um, and so I'm back here and now. I'm like, you know, trying to figure out like some other consulting. I'm I'm constantly in startup like communities. I'm in the YC startup school community. I'm in like different Facebook groups. I'm on Reddit and just constantly like talking to people and just being like, you know, in some cases just saying, hey, this is who I am. What do you think? Or if you guys need help. In other cases, just answering questions. So that's actually how I came across the next company. So Delta Leaf Labs, I was kind of, you know, because I've gone through certain kind of wellness and, and mental, like mental work in my life. Um, in early 2021 with COVID and a lot of people looking at health and wellness, I was like, okay, cannabis and psychedelics were an avenue which I was interested in. 
Um, and that's, uh, it, it just so happened. It, again, right, just giving to people back and forth. My buddy, Chris, my original uh, co-founder for Startup Studios and who was with me at Founders List, he's the one who actually found me Delta Leaf. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah he, he found the post that Elijah or Dr. Elijah Spina, the founder uh, and CEO of Delta Leaf, um, he had posted just asking like, hey, I need this kind of help. And if you know anybody, Chris found that. He was like, Seth, this is you. Go reach out. And um, Elijah was super busy at the time. The company was growing like crazy. And so I messaged him like three or four different times on like Facebook, on LinkedIn, on IG. And then he finally got back and was like, hey, thank you so much for following up. Let's get on the call. I, and I was in Pakistan at the time when I first connected with him. But I was like, hey, I'm available. I'm in the process of moving back. When I move back, I can come with you guys. They were in Santa Barbara. Um, but I was like, I have time. If you need me, let's, you know, as a trial run, let's do it. So I was uh, at first, uh, so March. You always until... speak really highly of him, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, amazing people. And Mar uh, Elijah and Michael, too, we're going to uh, hopefully have on the podcast, too, just to uh, also talk more about the Delta Leaf story. Because it's not mine to tell. It's actually Elijah's. It's his baby. But uh, I'm just grateful to have played a small part in it. Like the first three months, I was just part time kind of advising uh, Elijah on a couple of things. Um, then when I came came by, uh, when like I think two weeks after I got my my own uh, first COVID shot, right? I was feeling OK. I was like, OK, I can finally drive down, hang out with them for a weekend. And, um, you know, we, we kept just doing like uh, random like. It was a limited amount of hours in the in the contract, but I was like, hey, I've got time. I'm looking like just call me whenever day or night. And so they really liked that. And eventually the so Michael and Elijah offered me to become a co-founder and, and COO. Um, so I and I love that, like the company was doing well enough. Uh, it was a, a strong product. Um, we did about two hundred ten thousand dollars in uh, in revenue in twenty twenty one. Uh, 420,000 um, and real numbers in 2022. Um, and we should have, or sorry, uh, sorry. I, I So 2020 was 210, 2021 was 420. Um, so my, my first six months, we did very well. It was actually April of 2022 when crypto and a big, a big chunk of the market, uh, I actually heard about 60% of all cannabis companies shut down last year. We were one of them for a variety of reasons. Um, so outside of co-founder conflict, everything you could think went wrong kind of did, where we had an investor who only gave us half the funds and was like, hey, for the remaining half, go sue me. I don't have a liquid anymore. Like, you know, you're gonna have to wait. And we're like, without this money, we're not gonna survive. Uh, we The same investor had actually pushed us to launch our B2B and like, you know, kind of put a lot of like, kits and a lot of sales on credit with some larger like multi-state operating cannabis companies, which we did. Guess what? Once they're like a few hundred thousand dollars in accounts receivables is outstanding and they're not paying it for a small company like ours, we can't make payroll. We got two missed payrolls, like delayed, um, not full amounts, half of our staff walks out. And then we're like, okay, we've now half of our staff, is, we're working on skeleton crew. Elijah's in the lab day and night. I mean, there's so many sacrifices startups and founders make, which never come to light. And like only founders know what, what they go through. Um, and, you know, that's why I have a lot of empathy for anybody. However, you know, a lot of like investors and people can kind of be like, oh, this person's going to be like that and that. I try to give them a little more benefit of doubt because you never know what somebody's gone through. Um, and we tried, man, like from April, May, June, July, we tried like crazy, <laughs> like just cascading, you know, the house of cards falling down, yeah, uh, falling down. And it's brutal sometimes. Um, yeah. So August is when Elijah and Michael decided to shut down the company. I had actually, you know, real talk, like July is when I saw things were going to hell and they didn't want to leave. So I made the tough decision to resign like uh, a month before they actually decided to shut down. And um, one of the toughest parts of my life, I'm, I mean, uh, I'm being very selfish here when I'm saying like, I know Michael and Elijah tried very, very hard. I did too here and there, like to try and, and save the company. But um, yeah, Delta Leaf shut down in August of, of 2022. Um, and that's actually when, you know, I, I was... Like, 
Well, we're talking about imposter syndrome and we're talking about like, you know, what what does a founder do after after that? Like or what does yeah. anybody do after that, right? Like I'm thinking like shit, I was a VC and I was a VC in Pakistan. I understand. Like people over here, some people accept that experience, some people are like, whatever, like that, that's not impressive, which is which is totally fine. I, I know what bucket I stay in under. But then also coming back and then you know hearing like um, you know, the cannabis industry was fun because of Michael and Elijah, but I would never go back without it. Like, because there was, it's, it, it's difficult. Um, and so I was like, okay, what do I do now? Like, and, and that's kind of where, where you and I connected the first time where I'm, I just decided like, as part of my rebuilding, right. Because nobody ever talks about, about failure. And I was like, I don't care about like the people who I've supported. I, I've, I've tried to enable others in their companies good and bad, right? Some people may not have liked the way I did it. Some people may have thought I didn't do shit. Some people, you know, even as a, as a VC, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I, I don't think anybody out there could say, like, I I jeopardized their company or I ever did anything that wasn't in their best, best interest. And so that's kind of where, like, after Delta Leap was over, I was like, you know, screw it. Like, I'm just going to put myself out there and write about how I'm feeling and what I'm trying yeah, to look man. for and kind of manifest. And that's how I, I manifested uh, your beautiful ass where you oh, came out you. when, you know, you were working on Thrive and were like, hey, I need some help. And we worked together for a couple months, you know, it was a lot of good, some, some whatever, um, you know, so it, 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 which is, uh, you know, interesting enough uh, where even though we're not, we're, I mean, on Thrive, I still think I'm loosely affiliated. I'm helping you out, but yeah. you know, we we liked working with each other enough to where we're reviving, uh, kind of, or not reviving, but rather retooling startup studios into version 2.0, and that's kind of what you, I'm focused on these days. <laughs> that was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> give me a second here. Just give me a second, because like. I guess my point is, you've done so much. And I audited a lot of things. You know, you said seven times in some form or fashion, you know, I was lucky. You you said that seven times. Lucky, lucky. And and the word, I was lucky, I was lucky, I was lucky. And the only reason I, I, I remember that is because you said, like, I'm fortunate. Say it's lucky, just a different word. So it's just funny. It's. Well, and, really and actually, like, you know, I, I've I've honed in a little more on some co-founders versus others, right? But in, yeah. in the truth about it, my background, like my profile, I'm probably the, the like weakest person in all of those companies. So that's where all, all the, the attitude that I brought was that, listen, we're going to do it. So you, you know, there's no talk about like what the problem is. We're going to do, we're going to find solutions. If there is a big enough problem that feels like you know things are gonna fall or crumble or stuff, there needs to be somebody on the team who can help you know kind of motivate the team around like thinking through it and stuff. So I always always prided myself in that where I'm I'm plugged into different kind of teams and uh, kind of different um, different processes and just providing whatever support I can. And I get that. And I was trying to like bring it all together because I've, I've sat here and listened to all these amazing things, but it's like all in, it's the same thought process and it's not, it's so self-deprecating, but I kind of put you on that level of like, you know, in, in maybe it's, it's VC equating to VC. So in football, there's a, there's a position for players on the field, right? There's a quarterback running back, blah, blah, blah. So in the VCs, they might be like, oh, you need your CFO. You're this, you're this, you're this. Honestly, you're that kid I just put on the field. You just find the ball, like you're a playmaker. So like, I don't even, that's why like, even with Thrive Now, um, which is separate and you are affiliated with, and it's not even the reason I'm doing this is because I think every time I'm in Thrive, I'm talking to you in my head. I am, I'm you totally having a conversation. No, man, for real. For real, I'm like, man, Seth would probably blah, blah, blah. Or this is a, it's a, it's a true, it's like a true story. And that's cool because that's a testament to, well, you know, just all and even you know, like, and it's 
in in many cases right one of the things like it, it's difficult for somebody like me who like it's it, like somebody in in your case right like you're a solo founder you've been building this company sweating grinding away on it for years and then i came around um i'm helping you out just kind of loosely and trying to show you that i am making decisions that are best for the company right and and trying to prove myself and and that's the attitude again because i consider my profile kind of weak compared to everybody else it's like okay i'm here to prove myself to everyone and even the decision to walk away for to not work with drive anymore was kind of out of the same situation where some of your advisors thought that i wasn't the right fit so instead of arguing with them i decided it was best for drive for me to walk away and that's completely fine I'm glad we're still together. I mean, that made no dent in our relationship, thank God. And we're still like, you know, talking and and uh, working on Thrive together in some cases. I'm always here for you. Um, but it's the same mentality I brought. It, if it was, you know, it, it 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 depends on the company too, right? I'm not saying like if there was somebody else who I found off the street or or randomly connected me on LinkedIn and was like, hey, Seth, can you help me with this? Maybe no, the the... Right, the, the output could be different or the outcome could be different. It just so happened that with you, with a couple of other people that I've tried, I've been able to kind of help them solve some problems. And that's where I guess my value and being just resourceful and, and bring that kind of gung-ho uh, mindset. Like, I want to audit that again, dude. Like you, you, you drop just, you're spitting. You are spitting because, yeah, because that's, that's what most people don't want to hear or do. You walked, to, I mean, like you, you took the high road. You didn't, you didn't say, oh, well, the advisor who's in your ear, oh man, you know, what do they call that? Mentor whiplash. So everybody has to be right. Everybody. So if the advisor says one thing or whatever, you don't even know what they said. So that's what's even bigger of you. You're like, hey, listen, man. Yeah, that was really interesting. That's a really good way to put it. And And honestly, um, the only other time I heard this, and it's actually very recently, I think I mentioned my, he's actually a board advisor, Alex Martinez. He did the bio. Yeah. You know, the, he made a pact. He started a biotech, brilliant, brilliant guy with uh, his basically best friend who was like chief legal, brilliant JD. And they were thick before. And I think they made like a pact. And like, I'm not saying we were like that, but you could tell they really meant it. And they were like, listen, no matter what happens, we're going to stay boys. And they were like, like straight up. And, uh, and I kind of felt that there, which is really cool, man. It's actually really, really cool. And I think that's, again, if you think of a bigger picture where, oh yeah, we could say cool, but again, realistically, we're actually going to still work together. Yeah. No, and, and it was, it was a fun, like even I actually got a lot of the, uh, a lot out of that, you know, short engagement. I mean, it wasn't even really short. It was at least a couple months. Oh, man, we, we were that. talking day and night. Like, you know, and I, day. I, I practically, I had the co-founder hat on, or at least I was, uh, I was trying to prove myself in that regard. Right. So going through the co-founder questionnaire and kind of, you know, talking. Dude, I was, I was about to bring those up again. I was about <laughs> yeah. to bring those up. So it, hit on even, that for like, a second. Yeah, hit on yeah. it for a second. No, so, so and the maybe co-founder because, question there. Would, because yeah. I think that'd be part of kind of a, a small, and I don't mean to keep interrupting you, but it's like a small, but I'll still do it, but <laughs> a small vignette into the programs that Startup Studio is going to have. Yeah, of course. So, um, I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, maybe not all of my previous co-founders and early team, but at least you know, a good amount of them are going to be on the podcast. So I yeah. hope they'll be able to kind of show uh, or showcase why they're so badass and why I work with them, right? But um, like on, <clears throat> sorry, uh, what were you we talking about? I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, me too. Just kind of how you were and how you you took a graceful walk away. Oh, the co-founder questionnaire. Still, gonna, yeah. But we're, oh yeah, so, we're still going to work yeah. together. And you kept forcing this co-founder question and how this is going to be a great kind of program or or what you want to do for startup too. Yep. Year. There you go. So thank you. Um. So the with with that right, like, so with with this kind of the the experience that I had and and I'm only myself, but you know some of the other people had with um one of the companies that that I mentioned earlier. I was like, okay, the co-founder relationship, right? Like I, I've seen how it works. I've seen, yes, that you can, you should have somebody that you can trust. Um, and usually, you know, if it's somebody that you've grown up with, you've had some good and bad times with and have gotten over it, right? Like those are kind of the, the, excuse me, the secret ingredients that people say like, okay, that means that if even if the company's going to shit, they're going to figure it out. And the investors say that because you know, it's in their favor. But really I was like, 
the 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 um uh, and Cedric and Ben actually from the Nerditorium, they 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 had this uh this phrase which is like our interests are aligned. And that it's it's super simple and and you know you can you kind of dig in very deep and that's where the co-founder questionnaire comes in, right? Where a lot of the questions go into like, hey, what are you like your management style, your depression style? Like how do I look out for you? And again, going back to like me being a personal assistant for founders, it's like, how do I take care of you? And I, I think I, I or I tried to bring that for you at Thrive too. And I know a lot of what you've been going through. So, you know, like most founders don't kind of get that kind of support. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, man. The more <laughs> I sit here and listen to you, and again, the more I audit, I probably talk to you more than anybody. I would, I would definitely say it was co-founder. And it wasn't a stint, you know, that I would definitely say that was co-founder because man, it was texts, it was calls, it was Sunday nights, it was uh nah man, that was definitely co-founder interaction. Awesome. I hmm. appreciate it. Um Yo, and so real. well real. yeah, so the the questionnaire I found in like early 20 or like late 2020. Um, just like you know, over the first round blog. Um, and I was kind of going through the start YC startup school as well, trying to figure out like, hey, you know, what kind of programs and stuff to to look at or or how to work. Can I present myself and see if there's some founders who I can work with? Kind of I've always been, you know, like zero to one product builder, uh, zero to one like you know, sales builder, etc. So I was like, there's always a company out there looking. Um and um yeah, that's that's kind of where um the with, with startup studios rather like so the, the co-founder questionnaire kind of ties in with this concierge side where you know because of my limited experience right and my experience again from like pre-series a real talk like i've held i work with some companies series a and beyond but most of my experience is from pre-c to pre-series a uh in those cases, they don't need a consultant. They don't need an advisor. Most advisors are also like, you know, they're too busy for them. Um, even, you know, it's like a lot of your investors are just going to be like, listen, take my money. Don't fucking bother me again until there's an exit, right? And it, uh, But when you're an early stage company and when you need people who can wear multiple hats, which is also where I enjoy myself the most because I get the kind of uh, the trust that I need, the I get the autonomy that I need. I sometimes get the resources that I need to just make it happen, um, right? So, um, when 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 you're looking at it from that kind of aspect, I was like, okay, startup studios and and startup studios. I I had heard of as a term, or I was using as a term before this whole like you know new post accelerator kind of uh, model has come up, um, and I was just like. People who build startups, like that is literally the, the definition that I want to give to this and say, if you are a founder who may, uh, whether you are on the earlier side, or even if you've gone through a VC or an accelerator program, or, you know, you have the most amazing advisors and stuff, but let's say you're going through a problem that they aren't able to solve. You've gone, you've exhausted every other opportunity. I was like, try me, right? Like. I have, these are friends. These are people that I work with. I have failed. Like I have all of that stuff on my website on, on stuff like, Hey, I'm not successful in many ways, but I've tried a lot and I work with some badass people. So if you need an intro, I'm lucky enough to where they'll still pick up my call and listen to me. But like, listen, I came across this awesome founder. This is what their company does. It's kind of like the, the investor one pager, right? Like just create a brief, like, you should work with so and so for this reason, and um, that's kind of where the concierge model and the, the idea came about. And and when you and I were talking about it earlier this year, like literally less than a month ago, like uh, combining my network with yours, I think this totally. is gonna be this is gonna be awesome. And and the program, so I'm a little like that's where my imposter syndrome is. Like what where I don't think I can teach the program. Like maybe like some tidbits here, but I would rely on other people and and their expertise and their, their kind of success and and just like yours, right? Like the Mad Hat program that we're gonna be porting over to Startup Studios, um, that's gonna be mainly you. And I'm just gonna like at the beginning, I'm gonna be trying to gain my confidence by seeing you and how you're doing it because you know who knows. Like I I I tend to kind of limit myself by saying there's smarter people out there with way better 
you know, content and a way who can explain it way better than I could. So I tend to take a backseat. No, and that's, I mean, I think that's what's great is that once again, it's not a, yeah, it's just know your limitations, but you know your strengths as well, which is great. And I think that's, that's the beauty of it is you're never ashamed of it. Not like you should be, but a lot of people for some Can't reason, be. I don't yeah. know, well, what is that all about? Why do you think we, I was talking to somebody today about why they don't love themselves or put, appreciate themselves. You know, even the winds aren't even, the, the highs aren't even that high, but those lows yeah um you know and and just real talk like you were a big help for me just you know the last six months from august until now um and my wife would be the first to tell you uh this too like it, it w- it's been a lot of work um and again you know with the highs and the lows like right after delta leaf where i'm like holy shit what do i do do i go back like you know, and, and going through the interview process where people are like, oh, you have startup experience, you don't have any big company experience. So yeah. you know, even when I was thinking like, oh, I would love to go work for Microsoft or for Google or for Facebook, and people are telling me like, hey, they love startup people. But when you actually apply, they're like, oh, you know, you don't check whatever boxes or whatever. So going through those highs and lows and then working with you and then getting, you know, some income in and then be like, okay, things are looking up and then, you know, working with startup studios and stuff. So it's, like life after startup is a startup in itself. And I yeah. that's that's a big thing which I, I kind of want to also bring to the culture for startup studios where it doesn't matter if you fail too. Um, we hopefully once uh, you know once we're up and running, if there we come across some cool people who are looking for opportunities, it should be pretty easy for us to just email or, or send out a ping saying like, hey, so and so is available. Reach out if if you're hiring. Um, I'm taking notes. <laughs> but yeah i'm i'm super excited bro we got a lot of fun uh things to do and you know with yeah. the lps and and some of the programs and the vcs and people that we have in mind um, not only hearing their stories but then also just putting together the the resources and the database and offering office hours i think um you know for for people who need them uh there will always be people who will disagree or will say like, hey, you know, they don't they don't do this or they don't do that or maybe they don't fit these boxes. But I mean, you and I have both been in our own ecosystems long enough to know that yeah. it's it's pretty hit or miss. Um and there's some people who do it. Exactly. We're and and we're not we're not we're not showcasing anything different. No. We're saying this no. is what we've done. And with your badass experience and with my like, you know, kind of uh, do it approach, I think we can make some some really good uh, stuff happen. And people see that and they'll see that when they know, like you said, the network that they see and they, that we have an access to that'll pick up your phone. That's exactly, legit. Yeah. That's enough. That's a bigger testament than anything we could say. I'm excited to be doing this with you, bro. All right, man. Well, that was fun. Yep. No, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> uh we'll start dropping some knowledge on the website it's live the website is live um it's we're still working out some of the kinks but you know by the time people view this video or this this. podcast episode um yeah everything will be up and running and uh if anybody has feedback please comment please uh you know email us or contact us let us know and the concierge is is live though so so the office hours are open we got the free 20 minute calendar uh on there that's always free um 20 minutes use it for pitch decks use it for strategy or you know short planning sessions ask for intros uh otherwise if you need an actual like hour dedicated hour or two hours for myself or raj uh we have uh, discounted office hours there as well reach out anything we can do to help tune in next week sounds good thank you so much bro see you later later brother